What the horrors of war are, no one can imagine. Industrialized slaughter, fear, brutality, chaos, devastation of the soul, appalling human suffering. And yet, for some, wartime is claimed to be worse still. A time when the darkness is so thick that in it are bred some of the most horrifying creatures to walk the earth. Monsters. My name is Laura, and you are watching The Paranormal Scholar. The Long Walk, The True Story of a Trek to Freedom was published in 1955 and detailed the experiences of Slavomir Ravich, a Polish cavalry officer who, on the 19th of November 1939, was arrested by the Russians and, after brutal interrogation, sentenced to 25 years in a Siberian gulag. In 1941, Ravich, along with six other inmates, escaped the prison camp and began a harrowing journey which saw them travel over 4,000 miles on foot, through the Gobi Desert, Tibet, and the Himalayas, to freedom in British India. A tale of unimaginable determination in the face of imprisonment, of hunger, of sickness, of bitter weather conditions, Ravage's story is also a tale of the inexplicable, of a terrifying encounter with the Yeti. The encounter is said to have taken place in 1942, when, several months into their trek, the men were passing through a mountain valley in Tibet. According to the Polish soldier, they were forced to stop when they spotted two figures ahead of them. They were enormous, Ravage's testimony reveals, and they walked on their hind legs. Unknown creatures which refused to run away at the approach of men, the figures were undeniably imposing and were blocking the path which the escapees needed to take. And so, unsure as to what they were looking at, but certain that it was something unbelievable, the men sheltered behind the rocks and observed the enormous creatures for two solid hours. In the long walk, a high detail report of the creatures is provided. They were, based on Ravage's military training for artillery observation, not much less than eight feet tall one a few inches taller than the other, in relation of the average man to the average woman. Their heads were squarish, and their shoulders sloped sharply down to a powerful chest. They are also said to have had long arms, with wrists which reached the level of the knees. The Polish soldier also noted that their bodies were covered in a rusty kind of brown-coloured hair a close fur against the body, and a secondary layer of loose, straight hairs hanging downwards, which had a slight greyish tinge as the light caught them. Peeking out from behind the rocks, one of the soldier's companions, an American prisoner of war, said that he was certain they would witness the creatures drop on all fours like bears. But they never did. Instead, they shuffled quietly round on a flattish shelf below the men, it being obvious they had seen them and had no fear of them whatsoever. And so, they were not bears, neither were they humans. In fact, Ravage explained that the group decided unanimously that they were examining a type of creature which they had no previous experience in the wild, in zoos, or in literature. There was something of both the bear and the ape about their general shape, but could not be mistaken for either. In short, they defied facile explanation. Eventually, the men found the courage to push off around the rocks and slip away from the creatures. They were not followed, but for years afterwards, the bear ape figures remained a mystery to Ravitch. It was not until he explained that he read of scientific expeditions to discover the abominable snowman of the Himalayas that he realised what he and his companions had seen that day. Yeti, those strange, semi-mythical, man-like beasts described by native hillmen. Unfortunately, some of Ravage's companions were too scared to carry on after seeing the creatures, and chose to take a different, more treacherous route so as to avoid them. On this route, they fell to their deaths, leaving Ravage and the others to journey on, to freedom, and to the sharing of their incredible story 
with the rest of the world. It was October 1943, and London was under attack. All across the city, civilians took shelter, terrified as bombs rained down from the sky. It was apocalyptic. For a few, however, there was work to be done. Air raid precaution units patrolled the streets, enforcing blackouts and managing the life-saving sirens, and, in the worst case, helping to clear the rubble of the destroyed buildings in an effort to save as many as they could. A volunteer in one such ARP unit was a man called Howard Leyland. An undoubtedly courageous soul, he could not have possibly imagined that on that autumnal night, on the war-soaked streets of London, he would witness something infinitely more horrifying than anything that the wartime enemy could conjure. Yet another flurry of bombs was falling, causing the ground to shake and shatter as they exploded. Desperate for shelter, Leyland is said to have hurried to a nearby abandoned house. The inside was pitch black, and so careful not to reveal his position, Leyland timidly used his torch to locate a staircase. He intended to wait out the immediate danger before emerging to help those in need, all the while praying that the building he had chosen for his shelter, quaking and trembling around him, would not become his tomb and so he sat on the bottom step of the staircase and held his breath. It was at this point that it is reported that Leyland became aware of another presence waiting with him in the darkness. It was an indefinable and yet undeniable feeling. He was not alone inside the building. Fear crept over him until, unable to withstand it any longer, he switched on his torch and pointed it to where he sensed the presence was, above him at the top of the stairs. In the torchlight was a hellish sight, a monstrous cat-like beast, huge and hairy, patterned with stripes of black and brown. It had huge incandescent eyes, claws, and terribly sharp pointed horns, which protruded from its head like those of the devil. The creature is said to have stared at him in the gloom of the building, exuding what has been described as an aura of evil. And so, Leyland was transfixed, hypnotized almost, by the devilish feline, until it leapt towards him. Howling as it did, it pounced through the air and down the staircase, only to evaporate to nothing right in front of his eyes. With the monster gone, the spell was broken, and Leyland rushed from the stairs and towards the sound of human voices and footsteps which had just entered the building. Some of his fellow volunteers were there, searching for survivors, and he told them, in a fit of fear, what he had just seen. None of the other men reported having come across anything strange in the house. Neither had they heard the bone-chilling howl which Leyland described. Strangely, however, and much to Leyland's surprise, some of the volunteers were not entirely dismissive of his experience. There had been, they claimed, reports from others in the area of encounters with a similar shadowy cat-like creature with horns and hypnotic eyes. Leyland was shocked, so shocked indeed that his experience haunted him for many years to come. Eventually, he is said to have sought the help of a clairvoyant called John Pendragon. According to the account of the case contained within Pendragon's own autobiography, the clairvoyant was able to divine the location of the building on a map of London. After some research, it was discovered that the place had once been the home of an occultist and dark magician, who was rumoured to have regularly used cats, horrifically in his dark rituals. Driven mad by his black magic, the man had brought an end to it all, at the top of the very staircase where Leyland had taken shelter. After the occultist's passing, several in the area began reporting sightings of a huge, unearthly feline creature, a creature which perfectly matched the description given by Leyland. 
And so Pendragon hypothesized that the monster Leyland had seen that night was some sort of elemental being, a spirit which had adopted a feline form, brought into being by the horrific energy of that place of violence and dark ritual. An energy which was undoubtedly magnified and made darker still by the deadly bombs which fell on the city that night. In 1915, the world was at war. In Europe, Germany had created a fortress of men and trenches. On the Western Front, Great Britain and France hurled soldiers to be obliterated against this wall. In order to break the deadlock, Great Britain secured the seas and instituted a continental blockade. In response, Germany introduced to the world a devastating new tactic, mass, unrestricted submarine warfare. Against this backdrop of war and calamity, it is famously claimed that the crew of the SMU-28 submarine witnessed a marvelous monster rise from the sea. Baron von Forstner was the captain of the Imperial German submarine. His chief occupation was to prey on enemy supply ships, and so, on the 30th of July 1915, he and his crew caught up to the British steamer Iberian in the North Atlantic, which was transporting critical military supplies. After a brief exchange, the submarine prevailed, and the steamer sank so swiftly that its bow struck up almost vertically into the air. It took a mere 25 seconds for the steamer to submerge completely. It seemed like a perfectly executed attack. However, once below the water, there was a violent explosion, which sent pieces of debris and, if the story is to be believed, a giant aquatic animal up and out of the water. It was, according to the captain and the six officers who are said to have witnessed it, one of the wonders of the sea. The Baron himself described it as a deep sea crocodile. This great animal is claimed to have writhed and struggled amongst the debris of the steamer for up to half a minute, before sinking out of sight. This sensational encounter is supposedly documented in the Baron's personal journal, rather than in the submarine's log. Officially, the incident did not take place. Yet, it is not atypical for stories such as these to be occulted in official logs. After all, captains kept a log for the purpose of strategic military planning and not to document animals, most especially those of the fantastical variety. Thus, many have accepted the word of the captain, and so the tale has been handed down ever since. In an attempt to explain the sighting, some have speculated that the creature could have been a Pleosaurus a large marine reptile thought to have gone extinct millions of years ago. Indeed, the Baron's description of the creature possessing a long, tapering head and a long body seems to match that of the Pleosaurus. It is claimed that during their lifetimes, the officers corroborated their captain's shocking testimony. However, as the sighting was heavily overshadowed by the tumultuous events of the first half of the 20th century, any concrete proof of their attestations has since been lost. Thus, all that remains is the very matter-of-fact style testimony left to us by the newspapers which relayed Baron von Forstner's story in 1933. With 18 years having passed since the incident supposedly took place, it is undeniably a concern that details may have been lost, misinterpreted, or even fabricated. Certainly, there are some who argue that this sighting may have been invented, as a sort of nationalistic tale to counter that of the Loch Ness Monster, which garnered worldwide attention in that very same year. To throw further doubt on this event being real, there are the original contemporary newspaper articles from both the Washington Post and the Times which detailed what happened to the Iberian using the survivors' own testimonies. Not one mentions a sea monster. Even so, it is impossible to disregard the events which are said to have been witnessed from the SMU-28 submarine. 
Baron von Forstner was a well-regarded commander during his lifetime, and many of his peers would have shuddered at the mere insinuation that he might have lied. And certainly, it is quite possible that monsters such as the one described by the captain exist in the ocean's depths. After all, scientists estimate that there are more than one million species of animal in the world's oceans, and that we have only discovered one third of them. With so much mystery still left under the sea, who knows what wonders may live there, waiting to be found. In the mountainous regions of Central Asia, there is rumoured to exist an atrocious creature. One written description of the monster dates to 1876, when the renowned Russian imperial geographer and explorer Nikolai Provalsky pushed into the wilds of Mongolia. There, local people whispered of a man-beast, an extraordinary animal which, if given the opportunity, would attack and indeed prey on Provalsky. Based on his interactions with the locals, the geographer wrote how hunters were not only afraid of attacking the beast, but that the inhabitants removed their habitations from those parts of the country which it visited. After all, the creature was said to possess a flat face like that of a human being, and a body covered with thick black fur. Its strength was terrible, and its feet were armed with enormous claws. The monstrous animal was called the Almasti, a name which despite having numerous variants in local languages, has no known origin. Based on the research of one scholar, the term is so old that it is unable to be translated. Others have suggested, in desperation, that the term's closest translation is demon. Whatever the case, mere utterance of the name provokes fear, even today. And indeed, according to one of the most detailed recollections of an encounter with an Almasti, such fear is warranted. It was the autumn of 1925, and Mikhail Topolsky, a major general of the Red Russian Army, was trailing a troop of anti-Soviet guerrillas. According to the written testimony attached to this case, he and his scouting party were led to the Pamir Mountains of Central Asia, where it was believed the guerrilla fighters were operating. It was whilst passing through a series of highland villages that Tobolsky claims to have heard rumours of hairy man-beasts which local people warned were hostile to humans. Undeterred, the scouting party continued their search. They eventually came across the rebel troops' tracks, and followed them along a mountain path to a glacial overhang, a precarious, cliff-edge position where the by now exhausted guerrillas had decided to rest. The upper tongue of the glacier hung from the cliff, in which there was a cave. Surrounding the fighter's position, Topolsky and his men threw their first grenade. The explosion triggered one of the guerrillas to emerge and beg for them to stop. More grenades would cause the ice cave to collapse and bury everyone inside. After a quick discussion, Topolsky agreed that the man should return to discuss surrender with his companions, and so they watched as he went back into the cave. It is said that soon after, Topolsky and his men heard an ominous hissing as the ice began to move. At almost the same moment, they heard shots, and not knowing what they meant decided it was the beginning of an assault. Pieces of ice and snow started falling down from the cliff, burying the entrance to the cave. As it collapsed, three men came rushing out. The scouting party fired shots, leaving only one survivor. Breathless and seriously injured, he gave Topolsky the following information. They had not launched an assault, but had, in fact, been attacked themselves. According to the fighters' testimony, they had been discussing surrender when several hairy, man-like creatures, howling inarticulately, appeared in the cave, emerging so it seemed in the chaos from a dark crevice towards the back. There were several of them, and they had staves in their hands. In the attack which followed, one of the guerrilla fighters was supposedly clubbed to death by the creatures. 
The man recalling the story explained that he too was clubbed, being struck on his left shoulder as he rushed to the entrance of the cave. Ice and snow falling all around him, he just about managed to escape, one of the stave-wielding creatures hot on his heels. The survivor claimed that the hairy man-beast had fallen behind him, having been shot and subsequently buried by the snow slide. In disbelief, Topolsky ordered an immediate excavation of the area. Incredibly, a body was recovered. According to the written account, it had been shot three times, and was found near a stick made of very hard wood. At first glance, Topolsky thought the hair-covered body was that of an ape, and yet there were no apes in the Pamirs. Not only that, the body itself looked very much like that of a man. Certain it was some sort of trick, the scouting party's doctor made a full assessment, examining it, measuring it, even pulling at the hair to see if it was just a hide used for disguise. The creature, however, was real, and was most certainly not human. The carcass was determined to have belonged to a male, some five feet five inches tall, with well-developed muscles and hair all over its body. Judging by the greyish colour of its hair in several places, and the callous skin on its palms, it was thought to have been elderly. Examined by the soldiers, it lay dead in the snow, with its eyes open and its teeth bared. Chillingly, the teeth were large and even and shaped like human teeth, and yet no such man-like creatures were known to exist in the mountains. Unable to bring the heavy carcass down the mountain with them, the scouting company were forced to leave it, and so buried it where they had found it. As for the cave, and the other creatures claimed to have been crushed within, that too was left, the soldiers being fearful of another collapse. And so the Red Russians returned home, their objective in a roundabout way complete. If the story is to be believed, the enemy force was indeed shattered. Not by them, but by a group of Almasti. For centuries, Germans migrated to the Balkan region of the Danube River Valley. There, in this Slavic-dominated area, they formed a distinct cultural minority known as the Danube Swabians. These Swabians became an important factor in the 1940s, and served as a critical fifth column for their ethnic counterparts in Western Europe. Once they gained power, the Swabians, following the bloody trend which swept the continent at the time, committed many atrocities, earning them the hatred of the Slavic peoples whom they ruled. This reactionary resentment sent many into the woods to become partisans, fighting a guerrilla war against their oppressors. When the war eventually turned, the Swabians were abandoned by their allies, providing the opportunity which the partisans had been waiting for, the chance to mete out revenge which was so dark and terrible that many allege it was of supernatural proportions. Thousands of chilling accounts survive, both from contemporary official government reports and first-hand civilian testimonies from Slavs and Swabians, accounts which describe a horrific partisan disease. This disease was thought to have transformed Slavic partisans into superhuman monsters. One report details how the sickness conjured an epilepsy-like attack, during which the afflicted was seemingly possessed like a demon and would be thrown violently to the ground by an unseen force. What followed was animalistic voices and foam which would froth from their mouth until their body was worked up into a fury. In this savage state, the partisan would then attack people in the most fantastical fashion, tearing appendages from bodies, ferociously gnawing flesh from bone, and drinking blood. Thus, the afflicted became known as vampires. And fantastical is indeed an appropriate word for these tales. If it were not for the sheer quantity of reports from the area, combined with the mass graves still being discovered today, 
one could be forgiven for thinking it was all the invention of a gothic fiction author determined to sensationalise an already sensational period in history. As it is, historians do not argue whether or not these attacks happened, for they most certainly did. Instead, they are dismissive as to their alleged paranormal quality. Vampires, they assert, are not real. And yet, one can hardly ignore the plentiful otherworldly elements found in the testimonies of eyewitnesses. Accounts include those who describe the utter defenselessness of the Swabians in the face of the partisan vampires. Those afflicted by the vampiric sickness would be overcome by unnatural physical powers, and superhumanly strong would exterminate everything around them, all the while screaming for Swabian blood. Disturbingly, witnesses have even claimed that the afflicted were occasionally seen standing motionless for short periods, possessed by a vacant expression as they muttered, how sweet is this Swabian blood. Upon consumption, they seemed to be satisfied, and would regain their senses, returning to the state of a normal human being. Until the next time. And for some of those who were afflicted, there were many next times indeed. One alleged female partisan vampire acquired an especially dark reputation, for her attacks would always be brutal, and always come at night, earning her the nickname the Black Nada. She was known to have a terribly evil visage, made all the more terrible by the foam which would spurt in rage from her mouth as she performed her savage assaults. Another example comes from an eyewitness who supposedly saw a woman transform in the middle of Belgrade, near a Swabian high school. As in other cases, foam came from her mouth as she ran forth, screaming for blood. And so, what do we make of these undeniable accounts? Many have argued that the supposed vampire sickness was merely an enthusiastic embrace of folklore by the partisans. Yet, vampires are culturally present in many European countries, including Poland and Ukraine. Despite there being harsh guerrilla warfare in these areas also, vampirism and blood drinking was peculiar to the Balkans. Not merely this, it can be said to be a somewhat of an overreach to claim that actual traits of sickness, including uncontrollable foaming at the mouth, are merely representative of reverence for local traditions. And so could it be possible that in the midst of that great conflict, one of the worst mankind has ever endured, that something paranormal found fertile minds in which to plant its seed this truly awful thing being vampirism, a supernatural sickness that physically and mentally possessed many individuals. After all, if one can entertain the premise that people can be afflicted by the paranormal, possessed by demons even, in times of peace, then what abominable otherworldly horrors can take hold of someone in a time of utterly odious and wicked warfare? Thank you so much for watching, and an extra special thank you to our members, both here on YouTube and on Patreon, for all of the wonderful support you show our channel. Your kindness, encouragement and backing these past 12 months has been tremendous. As this is my last video before Christmas, I want to wish everyone who watches my channel a magical festive season, and all the very best for 2022. I'll see you in the new year. Merry Christmas.